can feel like the end of the world, can it? You've gotten discouraging news this morning that there's no money to hire a pastor. You listen to the news and the end of the world is coming. Church, this is where the rubber meets the road. Look at your words behind me on that poster. Those are your words. Can we only accomplish that when everything is good? Or are we called to be a people to demonstrate that that is who we are no matter what? Is our God faithful? So a little bit that you may not know about me is I have a tendency sometimes to be a bit aggressive and I believe that we need to tackle problems head on. I don't have a spirit of fear. I am not afraid of what the future holds for the world or in our context for this church. Not the least little bit. So let's have a conversation this morning. Let's tackle some of our problems head on so we know how to respond to them. So before I get started with the sermon, I do want to talk a little bit about the coronavirus and what is going on. Because I think there's a lot of what people don't know. There's misinformation. And if you go on social media, it's the end of the world. Well, first of all, coronavirus, some say that it's an old virus. Did you know that that is true? Coronavirus is old. COVID-19 is not. You see, it's a new strain of the disease. Because of that, because it's COVID-19, that 19 stands for 2019. It's something that just came about. There is no vaccine, which means... We have no way of treating it. Now, don't panic when you hear that. For the vast majority of the population, this is a respiratory illness that has to run its course. If you get it, you will probably get sick. You will be miserable like most people will be with it. And after a couple weeks, the vast majority of the population will be just fine. There are those in our community, though, that we need to look out for. There are the elderly. The, <laughs> I'm just calling like I see it, Gary. <laughs> there are the young children. There are those in our church who have compromised immune systems. If you have... A respiratory illness like emphysema or severe asthma, this will be problematic for you. You have a right to be concerned. So there are some realities that we face with the disease, but I want to keep things in perspective. Now, I understand that these numbers are already not accurate, but as of Friday, per the CDC, there were only 1,600 cases a confirmed case of, of coronavirus in the United States, 1,600. That number's going to go way up, yes, we know that, but this is where we are today. There was, the virus was present in 47 states. Only 41 people have died. Now, I, I'm not minimizing death, and I feel bad for the families that have lost people because of this disease, but this number is incredibly small. We have to keep that in mind. We have to have perspective when we face this. Okay? There was only 12 cases in Indiana and 32 in Illinois. So as people want to say that the world is ending, yes, this is a very fast-moving virus because there is no way to stop it. That's what the virus does. It moves from place to place. That doesn't mean that everybody that gets it is going to die. In fact, a very, very small percentage will. So what is the church doing? How are we handling this? We've had a number of meetings this week, as you've already seen. 
until we get through this, we're going to ask everybody not hug. I know you guys are lovers, and we want to love on one another, and I, it's hard for me. I want to love on you. But we're not going to hug. We're not going to shake hands. I've instructed our security team not to shake your hand when you come in. Don't be offended by that. That was per my direction. They're trying to keep you safe. If you are sick, do not come to this church, please. You may be fine. You may know that, oh, I just got a little bit of a fever, but I feel fine. That may be the case for you. The person sitting next to you may have a compromised immune system, like my wife does. What may be minor to you could be life-threatening to the next person. So if you are sick, please stay home. We stream the service. You can watch us from your home. If the virus gets bad enough, we will reach out to you. We're, we're still working on how we're going to do that. But we will, if we're forced to close the church, we will still have service. The worship team and myself will be here in an empty church, and we're going to worship for you. You can watch us online. I'll still give the message from right here. And we will still have church as a community. It will just be done a little bit differently. Judy already explained about Saturday. We're going to come in and clean next Saturday. Here's the great thing about the virus. What we do know so far, it appears as if the virus cannot survive very long outside the body. That means from Sunday to Sunday, they're thinking right now that the virus is only alive for two to three days. So anything that's left in here should be dead anyway. But we're going to take extra precaution and come in here and disinfect not only the sanctuary, but the children's area and the common areas. I'm going to recommend that you continue to follow the precautions of our government. They are continually monitoring this, and I'm going to defer to them. For goodness sakes, stay off social media, please. I can't say that enough. It, uh, listen, the world wants to create panic, and this is not a time to panic. If you want reliable news, I have two places for you to go. Listen to me. I am not one to spread fear, but I will share truth with you. Sometimes that truth is hard. That's why we're having this conversation. But if you want accurate news, one, I would go to the cdc.gov. Every day at noon, they update their website to give America the current statistics of where the virus is moving. Guess what? Every news source goes to the cdc.gov. Don't go to the news, go to the source who's putting it out. So go to the cdc.gov. If you want to watch news, listen to this carefully. Here's where I recommend you going. Go to the bbc.com. Yes, I said the British Broadcasting Corporation. Did you know that they actually report on American news better than we do? It's not perfect. It's not perfect. But it's not as biased as our own media outlets are, admittedly. I have tracked them for years. So if you want a look... And here's the other thing, not just in America, but what the disease is doing globally, they are doing an excellent job at relaying that news. So those are two good sources for you to stay informed in. Judy said, again, if you're sick, if you have to self-quarantine, or if you are hospitalized, please let us know that. Understand that hospitals are locking down visitations. It will be difficult, if not impossible, for me or somebody else from the church to visit you in the hospital because of the restrictions. But we're working on other ways that we can be in communication with you. you every hospital I know of has a phone in the room. We may have to simply call you and pray that way together. But we're here to support you to the best of our abilities through this. We are a family, yes? We're going to get through this together. In other words... Don't panic. We're going to end that this morning. There's no reason to panic. Did you know that the Bible actually tells us about the coronavirus? 
Did you know that? Let's look at it and see what Scripture tells us. If you have your Bible with you, would you please open it to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Now, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 30. This is a big passage. I simply don't know of a better place in Scripture to inform us of where we're at today. This speaks directly to the situations that we're facing and how we should respond to it as well. So because this is a big passage, I'm going to break this up into smaller verses. So I'm going to read just a little bit here. You can follow along in your Bibles, and then I'm going to explain where we're at. And we're going to kind of go back and forth with this. So if you would join me at 2 Chronicles 20, verse 1. And it says, oh, sorry, before I jump into that, the context. <laughs> I always tell you, you have to have context, and I almost skipped right over that. How we get to this point in Scripture is that the kingdom of Israel has been created. So you are reading this one-year Bible plan. You are going to read very shortly about how the kingdom of Israel is created. And the first king is going to be King Saul, and then you have King David and King Solomon. I think most everybody here is probably familiar with them. After King Solomon, there is a political coup that occurs. And the kingdom of Israel is broken in two. And you have the kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. And from this point forward, there's about 40 kings that lead these kingdoms. Most of them are bad. But there's a few that are good. We're going to read this morning about one of the good kings, Jehoshaphat is one of the few good kings of Israel. And how he responds to this crisis tells us exactly how we are to respond today. So as we enter into verse 1, we're going to, receive, we're going to understand that Jehoshaphat has just received some very bad news. And it says in verse 1, After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, with some of the Menuhites, come to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazon Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Let me pause. So you notice something in there. This is a king. We think of kings as powerful leaders, right? But did you see that he's alarmed? This is a vast army. Now, we don't know the size of this army. But what we do know is that multiple nations have come together to wage war against Israel. This is an insurmountable army. They cannot defeat this army. And because of that, the king is alarmed. So what does he do? He seeks the Lord. Do you see the humility of the king? He recognizes in his humanity his own fear but instead of running, he seeks the Lord. And the first thing he does is to assemble the nation of Israel, and he proclaims a fast for all of Judah. And it says, they came from every town. An entire nation is called the fast. We have talked about fasting, and I won't go back into that, but I have said there are times of such great significance that you will see in Scripture that God calls us to not only pray, but to fast. Here we see an entire nation fasting. Let's pick up in verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, 
Are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms and the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague, insert coronavirus, or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress. And you will hear us and save us. But now, here are men from Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah, with the wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. Wow. That's saying a lot already, and we're just getting started. So I want to point out a few things. Did you see where they're meeting? It says that they assembled at the temple of the Lord. They're at church. They're assembling at church. And the king, their leader, begins with prayer. And his prayer begins with praise. He says, are you not the God who is in heaven? This is not a question. This is a a way in the Hebrew language to affirm something. Let me see if I can play this out a little bit better. Are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand. And no one can withstand you. That is praise. And he continues on in verses 7 through 9. He says, Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever? To the descendants of Abraham, your friend. They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name. Did you hear what the king is doing there? The king is thanking God for the land that he gave them. Literally the the geographical land of Israel. And he's thanking them for the temple church, when's the last time that we thank God for this land and this building? Maybe we've made a mistake. Can we own that? Maybe we need to do that today. The king is also admitting that Israel is powerless against this enemy. Imagine that. A king that is humble enough to say that he is powerless. They do not know how to defeat this army. Did you hear earlier though, in the previous passage, wage war, it's not just a sort of judgment or a plague. You can insert that in there. That it says, we do not know how to defeat this virus, but we're trusting in God. By doing so, this shows humility, submission, And faith. Lastly, look who is in attendance. You see, normally when Israel is ready to wage war, they assemble all the men who are of battle ready age. And the king would talk to them and send them out. But that's not what scripture says here. It says, All the men of Judah with their wives and and children. And little ones, that means babies, stood there before the Lord. 
everyone is present in the temple. In our dire moments, we need to assemble our families at the church. We need to trust God. We need to be united together. Picking up in verse 14, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehazel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. The Old Testament can be tricky at times. (laughs) He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your possessions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Seven weeks ago, I preached on the Trinity, specifically about the Holy Spirit, and how the Holy Spirit will sometimes equip us for a message. This is one of those times. It says that the Spirit of the Lord fell on the son of Zechariah. And he proclaimed something. He says, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Church, this is what you need to hear. When you read scripture, if there is a word or a phrase that is repeated, that is done for emphasis, it's of importance, Listen to what the Holy Spirit is stressing to a nation that is facing an insurmountable odd. Do not be afraid or discouraged, verse 15. Verse 17, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. It's being repeated. For the battle is not yours. We don't have a vaccine. There's not a thing we can do about this. It's God's. Verse 15, verse 17, you will not have to fight this battle. In other words, the battle's not yours. See the deliverance the Lord will give you. God is going to fight this battle for us. If they do this, the Lord will be with them. Picking up in verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshipped before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohothites and Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Notice that? They've received the news of what's coming. A prophet has told them not to be afraid, and they respond not by running out the door, not by trembling in fear. They respond with adoration and praise, church. That's important. Listen to how the church is reacting. Verse 20. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. So this army, the army of Israel, is now in motion, moving towards this battle. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. The king is calling everyone to have faith in God. He says, trust God, trust what the Holy Spirit has given to the prophet, for that is good, and if you do this, you will be successful. It's a simple equation. We trust in our God. Then in verse 21, after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness 
as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. That single verse makes me shake my head every time I read it. I was in the army. I've served many different positions in the army. One of them was called a point man. I was the guy that stood at the front of a formation as we moved through enemy territory. It is in the most dangerous position. The point man is the one that's going to take the enemy fire first. Notice what God does. Does he put his best soldiers that he can trust in out front? No. He gathers singers and puts singers out in front of the entire army praising God for what God is about to do. Can I say that is a bravery and a faith that I personally aspire to? That is incredible what he is doing there. Verse 22. As these men began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. This is their friend. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one, let me repeat that, no one had escaped. Imagine, you need to visualize this, church. Imagine that you're part of this army. You have been marching towards this place where this great battle is to take place. You know as you are cresting this hill that on the other side is this army the size of which is going to annihilate you. And when you cross over the crest of the hill and you look down into the valley, everybody's dead. What just happened? Do you notice who fought for Israel? God. Do you realize that Israel is only a spectator? They never lifted a weapon. God is at work for us. God is waging war for us. Verse 25. So Jehoshaphat and his men went, off to, went to carry off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. Notice how God is rewarding Israel for their faith. He gives them the plunder from this war. If you've been reading the Bible, this should sound somewhat familiar. If you read Exodus 3, the God, sorry, God created plagues over Egypt. He fought Egypt by way of plagues, so much so that Pharaoh said to the Hebrew people, go, leave. And when they left, they took the wealth of Egypt with them. That was their plunder. God rewards those that are faithful. Verse 26 On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Baraka, where they praised the Lord. This is why it is called the valley of Baraka to this day. Then, led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lyres and trumpets. 
The fear of God came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. So we've read through this and we've read how God has fought the battle for Israel against this vast, insurmountable odd. And Israel, in turn, rejoices. And it says they entered Jerusalem, went to the temple with harps, lyres, and trumpets. Let me rephrase that. They went to church. They gathered in front of instruments like these behind me to give praise and adoration to the God that had rescued them. And in that, did you hear how because of the surrounding nations seeing what God had done, they became fearful of Israel's God. Because of that, they did not want to wage war against Israel. They became a nation of peace. Finally, Israel had peace. As we're closing up today, I'm going to ask the worship team, Ryan and whoever else is coming up here to come back. We're going to close in song today because we are going to worship. Just like this passage taught us how Israel, before they went into battle, Israel worshiped with adoration and praise before the event happened. So we're going to do that this morning. But here's what I want you to learn from this. A few takeaways, if you will. Number one, as individuals, when we are faced with a crisis, we should meet it with equal force in prayer and fasting. Number two, if the issue is big enough, the entire church should be involved. We started this back in November. I told you that in this search for a senior pastor, that we are to be fasting and in prayer together. That hasn't stopped. Now we have this coronavirus to deal with. Church, we should be in fasting and prayer together every week. Number three, trust in your God. I don't know what else to say there. Trust in your God. Number four, which we're about to do, worship with praise and adoration. Scripture says that we don't have a spirit of fear. We're not going to be afraid in this time. We're not going to panic because we don't have the funds to hire a lead pastor. We're not going to panic because the world is running out of toilet paper for a respiratory illness, by the way. We're going to stand firm and demonstrate to the world that we have a God that is greater than all of this. Number five, when this, when this crisis is over, we are going to rejoice in what the Lord has done. I'm already proclaiming that. I want to read one piece of scripture here. It comes from verse 9. It says, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or coronavirus or SARS or whatever it is, church, we will stand in your presence, God, before this church that bears your name, and we will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us, and you will save us. Do you believe the word of God? Yes. Let us bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our almighty Father, that in you we have safety and security 
There is no room for fear in the heart of a Christian. We thank you for this church. We thank you that decades ago, you cast a vision in people's minds. They purchased this land and they built this building. Father, thank you for all that has done, been done through this church. And we thank you for all that will be done through this church. With this current health crisis that this nation, that our world is facing, we do not have fear. We trust in you. We thank you in advance for fighting this battle for us. For those that will fall ill to this disease, to this illness, may you help us, support them, guide them. I ask for strength and courage for those that become ill. Be with the families. Draw them close. May they feel the warmth of you and your heart upon them in this time. Lastly, Father, I ask that you protect this congregation. Keep us safe in this trial. We believe in you and we trust in you. And we give thanks in your son's holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing this hymn together?
Church, as we depart this morning, the ushers will be at the doors to collect your tithes and offerings. And at this time, if you would like to receive a blessing, would you put out your hands like this? Brothers and sisters, trust in your God. He has always been. In him we find no fear, no doubt, no trepidation. Stand firm in this trial, for that is what it is. Know that we will endure and come out blessed on the other side. Go now, not hugging anyone (laughs) like normal, but tell somebody that you love them, and we will see you next week. Amen.